So the best part is coming, by the way. If you think we've gotten to the best part of this yet, it's coming. Okay, here we go. I, th- I think what's what, what what always felt alarming to me just in the chair is... You know, First, I just love guys who talk like that. What always felt alarming to me in the chair... <laughs> It, what, he, what he means when he's when he's sitting on a panel on MSNBC in the chair. It's just such a freaking weird way to talk. It, anyway, here we go. Yeah, it's like you're, you know you're sitting with I, your I friends think... who aren't in media, and you're like, "There I was in the chair." In the chair. <laughs> I was leaning in. <laughs> I think what's what, what 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 always felt alarming to me just in the chair is you know this whole question of what is normalized and what's abnormalized if that's a word, or it is now brought to you by the Hill. Uh, I I think there's, I I was just in many conversations in which the idea of kind of any ambitious social policy was reflexively kind of wild-eyed, kind of long hair, hippie-ish, kind of, you know, there, there was just, and it's not, I often don't even think people mean to be doing it. I, I, I don't think it's actually because the analyst next to you is always texting with a billionaire under the table, although sometimes they may be. I, I, I think it's habits of mind. And I think journalists in particular. Okay, maybe, let, let, me, let, let me just. I, let me play the rest of that and then, then we'll come back because this is a jaw dropper. Uh, he's saying the problem with journalism is habits of mind. That's, that's his own term. I think he invented it. But here he's going to explain it. Here it is. Particular. A lot of the training is about sobriety and is about caution. And journalism, he says journalism training. As far as I know, there really isn't any journalism training. So I don't know what he's talking about. I'm not a journalist, but none of them seem to be trained. So here we go. Well, they, about, they go to eighty thousand. They go to eighty thousand dollar a year uh, journalism schools at Columbia University, yeah. where they meet other elites and network each other, network with each other. But there's no real training that goes yeah, on there. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, I, and it's I, just as, elite networking for like jackasses who want to like uh, you know have blue check marks and wear lanyards and yes. work, get fellowships and things like that. There are two kinds of people who go to journalism school: uh, suckers <laughs> and shitty journalists. <laughs> That's just a fact. Okay, here we go. Not the big sweeping thing, and is about skepticism, and that's good. Those are good. Those are good values. But when a weapons of mass destruction, flimsy weapons of mass destruction story, is able to get through all of those layers of skepticism, or when you know Trump does some. So what? I'm going to stop again. I can't help it. But so what he's saying. Is that a story like WMDs? Again, he goes, got to go back 20 years. He could go right now. He's not going to do it because he'll lose his job. So he goes back to WMDs and he says, you know, it's troubling that th- that a story that is so flimsy. It, there was, it's not actually as flimsy as Russiagate. Russiagate's more flimsy. And he says that a story like WMDs is so flimsy that it could get through all those layers of protection that journalism has embedded in its structure. Oh, my God. How could that happen? I don't I don't know, Anon, what fucking world you think you live in or who you think you're talking to. But that's Habits not in mind. That's not an act. What's that? Habits of mind. Habits of mind. Habits of mind. That's not an accident that WMDs somehow slip through all these fact-checking filters. Let's remember the primary function of the media, Anon, is what? What is the primary function of the news media? The primary function of the news media in the United States. The primary function is to forward the agenda of the elite. That's their primary function. In other words, to manufacture consent. That's their primary function. So this fucking idea that somehow they just have bad brain thinking and it's not because of who owns them or who funds them, but somehow it's because of personal peccadilloes and personal failings inside each journalist. That is propaganda. 
He knows that's propaganda. And Anand is fucking gaslighting you. And anybody who thinks his new show is going to tell anybody any truth that you haven't known before is now who's being naive, Kay. Because this guy is gaslighting you at the at fucking 200 miles an hour. That is such bullshit. Well, I'll, let me throw it to you. Go ahead. What is what is what is habits of mind? What does that even mean? Well, here, here I mean, he'll explain it. It's he, not a structural analysis of media, and it's completely just there is a left. I mean, you referred to Ed Herman and Noam Chomsky's uh, analysis of propaganda, their propaganda model of manufacturing consent. He just throws it completely out the window. <laughs> out the window. It's a structural uh, analysis of political economy and media. He throws it out the window and he individualizes it and just says that journalists just, you know, they're in the wrong mind state. You know, maybe they need like, um, you know, better feng shui in their houses or maybe they need uh, to read his book. To, I don't well, know, he, but that's it, what he it's said. not structural. That's yeah, it's not a structural problem with the media. It's individual. And watch, he has a solution, Max. Watch, he actually can fix journalism with his book. Watch this. In incredibly uh, destructive of the rule of law. And you have an article saying this is an interesting election tactic. There's a kind of the skepticism is suspended sometimes. But something like Medicare for all, which is which should be have less skepticism just because it's in place in so many countries that it can't be impossible. Right. Um, and, and which so many people want, the, the, the tone around that is just kind of like dismissive. And if and you, you are a regular- What do you think accounts for that? I mean- <laughs> So he's saying the problem is the tone <laughs> around Medicare for all is dismissive. And I, I, know the, I know why that is. Max knows why that is. And I'm sure- Crystal Ball knows why that is, which is why she asks him that question. Why do you think that is? What the fuck? Let's get to it. What's the real problem here, dick? And he doesn't. Here's what he says. You want to hear what he says is the real problem? Here it comes. I think there is at some level, in some moments, you know, the fancy corporate executive calling down to the newsroom and saying, never ask that question again. I'm, I'm not saying, saying that doesn't happen. Don't cover Harvey Weinstein, for example, or Epstein, <laughs> right. right? We've yeah. seen that. Yeah, and we, or don't have that on a skeptic of Russiagate, the number one story dominating the news for three years. Don't do Honestly, that either. Uh, yeah, and we, we know enough to know that that does sometimes happen, right? I will also say, I think people imagine that to be the issue much more than it is as a percentage of the time, right? So I will say... I so he's saying, yeah, that happens, but it's, it doesn't happen often enough to worry about. That's not the problem. He's saying that's not the problem. He's saying it's not the problem that they didn't cover Jeffrey Epstein and they didn't cover Harvey Weinstein because of direct executive intervention. That's not a problem. <laughs> he's saying that uh, that happens. Not a problem. That's really what he's saying. And then he because he's going to go tell you what the real problem is. Here it is. Eleven years, at The New York Times, five years at MSNBC. In my per not fired from either of them, by the way, She's 11 years at The New York Times. Five years at MSNBC, never an employment problem, no human resources letters, no problem. Just so you know, he's that kind of a lefty where he gets along perfectly inside of an oppressive corporate structure. Okay. Personal experience. That kind of thing has never been the thing, has never been anything I've personally witnessed, right? I read about it in the Matt Lauer kind of thing. But, but like, that's, that's not, you know, people always would, at parties would be like, ugh, New York Times, man, like, you must be getting these... Advertisers just telling you what stories you can write. And that is just so wrong. It's just not how the New York mm -hmm. Times works. So, so now he's trying to pretend that advertisers don't have an influence over the content inside of the New York Times. That's just not how it works. Oh, you're, oh, look, I'm sorry, we're wrong again? Oh, I'm sorry, we're idiots? Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm so stupid. I thought advertising had an effect on what gets printed in a newspaper because in manufacturing consent, it said it's the primary concern of what gets written in a newspaper. But I'm sure your critique, while working for the New York Times and now MSNBC and Vice, is probably more accurate, right? That is so... Can you... I just... Go ahead, Max. Say something smarter than me. No, I agree. And, and, you know, New York Times, for example, it has a partnership with Verizon. Um, it has a corporate partnership with Verizon. So it ran a series of articles last year uh, claiming that 
uh, Russia, Russia was sort of covertly stirring up opposition to 5G in the US. Um, who would have an interest in the proliferation of 5G in the US? Could it be Verizon? And you know, their, their basis for that article was so shabby. It was that uh, my friend Dan Cohen, uh, you know, who's, he's, he was at RT America at the time as a correspondent. He was just interested in 5G and potential um, harmful health effects. And so he did a s series of pieces on it. And that was their evidence. He's no longer at RT. Um, you know, but that was, you know, it was as, as if Putin planned this whole thing, but you know, there's so much more to say about the media we see in, in, in the New York times. I mean, one thing we should look at is the role of think tanks, uh, and who's funding the think tanks and how they're constantly quoted as experts when think tanks are basically pay for play for various foreign governments, for the arms industry on foreign policy, for billionaires like Bill Gates. Um, and, you know, if you look at anything written about Russiagate or, for example, something about China and how they're this imperialist power that wants to take over the world and you look at who the experts quoted are and then you actually look at the think tanks and who's funding those think tanks, it's the arms industry. The Atlanta Council is funded by Saudi Arabia. It's funded by NATO. It's funded by the State Department. You have this phony operation called the... Um, the Alliance for Securing Democracy, which helped uh, influence Russiagate on Russian propaganda, and it's quoted as an independent entity. It's run by a former uh, Clinton foreign policy hand and a neocon named Jamie Fly, and they're funded through a third party by the State Department and USAID. It's basically a lot of U.S. government propaganda, and it's you know these journalists see themselves sort of as state stenographers to push. U.S. empire. And another factor that he's completely leaving out here is class. Journalists tend to come from a particular class and they're advancing their class interests and they're also working their way up the ladder through many of their sources who are influential government officials or billionaires. And then there, you have this kind of revolving door where journalists move into government or they go to work for billionaire foundations. Again, he just individualizes the whole thing. One good example of that, by the way, is Matthew Pottinger, who's helping to design Trump's extremely hostile uh, policy towards China. He was a former correspondent at the Wall Street Journal um, in China. Uh, let's get back to this. Let's listen to the rest. One thing, it happens sometimes, but it's, I think people way over imagine how yeah. much that happens. I think then you start, as you go this way down the spectrum, um, look, are there things like, well, we're going to have a, you know, a urban revitalization conference and JP Morgan is the sponsor. So we're just going to, change what we put on the panel and not right yes that that starts to happen I, that's so now I, correct me if i'm wrong max he just contradicted himself he originally said oh it must be tough working at the new york times because all your advertisers tell you what stories to write that's not how it works and then he says so we're doing a new york times is doing a panel and uh do, you know we're being sponsored by a bank so maybe we change who's on the panel you mean yeah. maybe you totally change the presentation of your fucking event because of the money that you're going to get? You mean you're going to do that? But that would never happen in the newspaper, you fucking moron. Of course. What is, I get it. It's like I can catch you. I'm catching you, Anand. Me. In my fucking garage, I'm catching you. It's because it's obvious you're fucking full of shit. Am I wrong about that? Didn't he just do what I said he did? Yeah, and, and he's sort of obfuscating because... That's what, I mean, what is the difference between that and advertising? That's how corporate media works. That's how just media, a lot of just mainstream media works. For example, the Atlantic Magazine, which is considered sort of the highbrow publication for every smart urban liberal, you know, you get the smart takes there. Um, the Atlantic holds a conference every year with gigantic corporations, including arms dealers like Boeing, and they pay for panels with Atlantic editors and Atlantic contributors and various experts. And that's how Atlantic, the Atlantic takes in a lot of its money. It's the same thing as advertising, and it completely colors the editorial parameters or sets the editorial parameters. It's a good reason why you have someone like Jeffrey Goldberg, who is a former Israeli prison guard who has been wrong again and again, who helped push the Iraq war, who helped attempt to push war on Iran, who as the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, someone who's basically a cipher 
for the Israel lobby and who would never think of challenging corporate power in any meaningful way, let alone America's imperial foreign policy. Okay, here we go back to him. And a self-censorship. Then you keep going this way down. Okay, so now, so he, and by the way, he's dismissing all these things as he goes along. He dismissed yeah. the effect of advertisers. He, de- he dismissed the effect of banks and whatever who's in sponsoring their event. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he dismissed the executive directly interfering. All those three things he directly dismisses. And now he's going to tell you what the real problem is. Spectrum, you get to what I think is the real issue in a way why I wrote my book. It's habits of mind, right? And I actually think there's something very optimistic about the idea that a lot of habits of mind are responsible for this. So I'll give you my example of what I tried to do in my book that I think shifted some of the journalists. When people, Just so you know, he's making up a term uh, that doesn't exist in the world yet, habits of mind. Uh, there doesn't mean anything. It's an empty term. And he's going to posit a theory that this is what's wrong with journalism. And it's based on absolutely nothing but anecdotal evidence that he's amassed personally. <laughs> Absolutely no analysis of the structural problems of the media or how we gather news or what the fuck. Nothing. They don't even mention manufacturing consent. They don't even mention uh, Noam Chomsky. They don't mention the most important seminal work on the topic. It doesn't even come up in this conversation. But he's going to tell you what the real problem with the media is. After he, after he dismissed every real problem, he's going to make up a phony one and convince you, try to convince you like, he's, like Barack Obama bullshitted you for eight years. He's going to try and convince you that this non-problem is the, in fact, real problem. So, some of the journalists. When people were writing about philanthropists making these big splashy donations three years ago, right? A lot of people who make $40,000 a year were writing about this stuff in this like congratulatory way. I don't think they were on the take. I don't think advertising executives were telling them to do it that way. I think it was honestly a habit of mind. Here is how you write the philanthropic announcement story. That's the real the real problem isn't the corporate money influence. It isn't the ownership of the media. It isn't the, the elite that are. Uh, it isn't the fact that this guy, and he doesn't even know it, has been groomed to work at the New York Times and MSNBC since he was in kindergarten. What do you mean by that, Jimmy? Because if you color outside the lines in kindergarten, they fucking put you in another group. If you color outside the lines in first grade, if you start questioning shit, you don't get invited to Harvard. You don't get invited to the New York Times and you don't get invited to talk on MSNBC. If you're a normal, natural, your instinct is to question power. And that's why I don't sit in those editorial meetings. But a guy like this does because he's been groomed for it since he was fucking born and he has no idea. And I have more awareness than smarty pants fucking beautiful hair does. And but that's, of course, why he is every time he turns around, another corporation is handing him a platform because he is manufacturing consent, a term he won't ever use in his critique of media, because that's what he's fucking doing while he critiques media. He's literally manufacturing consent that media is OK. And the problem is individual journalists, not a structural problem. That's literally him manufacturing consent while he's trying to tell you that he's telling you what's wrong with journalism in fact he's a gaslighting propagandist of the highest order yeah part of part of the uh part of the whole um structure of manufacturing consent uh it requires the appearance of dissent and that's where he comes in that's where he comes in he appears to be dissenting against this odious institution that almost all Americans hate. The, main, the mainstream media is the most hated institution in American life. And at the same time, he is posing as this kind of uh, new age guru who can individually cure each journalist uh, and their habits of mind uh, if they go through some kind of workshop. I don't know exactly what he's proposing, some kind of seminar um, but you know, he actually offers Can I play no that? substance here. Let me play that. Here's, here's his, and here's how he remedies it. This problem that he, he invented. It's not a real problem. He invented it. Habits of mind. He invented it. Here's his solution. It's his book. 
I wrote my book. I started talking to a lot of these journalists, sometimes on air, sometimes quietly, privately as friends. And I started seeing a lot of these journalists were like, you know, it never occurred to me to write about how much taxes someone has paid in the philanthropic gift story. I may have written that in the other story six months ago. Right. And now, if you look today, a lot of those same people include how much they pay workers, what strikes have been happening in the day one announcement of the philanthropic gift, right? And so I think it's actually possible to rewire people's habits of mind. I don't think it's going to give someone like Bernie an, an easy ride to the presidency. There is a huge amount of power out there. But a lot of the way that power works, in my view, is training people's mental habits. And all of us participate in the fraudulent mental habits. And the, the, the hope is that all of us can actually rewire ourselves to mm. different mental habits. Yeah. And that so, Max, do you agree with his, uh, pre, uh, his theory that all we need to do is rewire the way journalists think? Because they've been wired to not think good enough. Well, he completely just... He, he just completely omits completely. any mention of corporate control. He omits any mention of the role of the kind of imperial permanent war state in infecting journalism and transforming it into part of the U.S.'s global information war. He just doesn't offer any structural analysis of why, for example, as, the, as fairness and accuracy in reporting showed, in a survey of op-eds published about Donald Trump's airstrikes on Syria, missile strikes on Syria following a chemical attack that we at the gray zone, using documents from OPCW insiders and whistleblowers have shown was a phony staged event, why only one op-ed expressed opposition to those missile strikes. Uh, over 40 other op-eds across the country supported it. Could that be about habits of mind or something structural. Why is it that people like you and I and Aaron Mate or Ben Norton, uh, you know, all of these people that have sort of been gathering together in this alternative media community, uh, despite whatever audience we have, why we'll never get a hearing in mainstream media except when they want to smear us as Russian assets or something. It, could it be habits of mind or there's something structural taking place? Why is it that the, you know, the, the, the critique of Bill Gates, who I don't think is behind some conspiracy to produce coronavirus, it has been completely left to the far right. And there's so little critique of him on the left or on the center left or in mainstream publications like the New York Times. It couldn't be because he's donating millions of dollars to media organizations. And in fact, reporters are on the take. Yes. I mean, what is MSNBC? That's something that was straight up founded by Bill Gates, <laughs> Microsoft. Up. It was straight up founded by him and he's not paying taxes. Uh, the, the person that the New York Times has covering, uh, covering the pandemic, who actually produced this documentary, I think called Pandemic, which was a vehicle for promoting Bill Gates. Sherry Fink used to be at the New America Foundation, which is funded by Bill Gates. So a lot of these people in many ways are on the take and he's wrong to say they're not. And if you look at think tanks, the role of think tanks, uh, you can start to see the real structural problem. It's not gonna be cured by some uh, feel good seminar. Let me just say that habits of mind, um, I guess Anand didn't notice that the New York Times endorsed every right wing war in the last 50 years. Is that when, habits of the, mind? What was the last war they opposed? That, never. They've it. never opposed a war in my lifetime. Uh, he what also, was the last free trade agreement they opposed? Right. Hey, did you did, did Anand notice that the New York Times opposed all social movements from civil rights to Occupy Wall Street? Was that habits of mind? Mm -hmm. He forgot that he himself and everybody else at the New York Times is from Harvard or Yale. Is that a habit of mine that they just hire from Harvard and Yale? New York Times going from endorsing Hillary to endorsing Amy Klobuchar. That didn't ring an alarm bell for you. Or is that a habit of mind? Is that what's happening? How about Chris Hedges getting pushed out for telling the truth about the Iraq war? That didn't catch your eye. Is that was that a habit of mind? Or how about radically dissenting opinion is never generated or showcased at the New York Times for obvious reasons? Is that 
A habit of mine, Anon? Or are you fucking gaslighting us so you can keep your corporate position? I'm going to say the latter. <laughs> I'm going to say you're gaslighting us because you're a corporate toady on purpose. And in fact, it's not a habit of mine. It's actually predictable. And what do I, what do I mean it's predictable? Well, if you look at Anon's, do you know where he comes from? So after graduating from college, Anon moved to Mumbai in 2003. Why would he do that? Oh, I know. Because he got a consulting job for who? McKinsey. He was working for fucking McKinsey. This guy, Mr. Lefty, was working for McKinsey. That's that same outfit that everybody gave Pete Buttigieg a hard time for because they're they're freaking they hate anything progressive. They're a corporatist screw machine. Uh, after that, oh, by the way, you know who else worked at McKinsey besides him? Do you know who else was a uh, was a director at McKinsey? Can you, you want, can I give you three guesses? First guess is his father. Yes, his father was a director at Kinsey. He gets out. So do you see how this guy has been groomed his entire fucking life to come on TV and gaslight you into thinking that the only problem with the media is that the journalists' individual patterns of thinking, not the fact that those journalists are selected because they think a certain way, just like he's been selected and groomed his entire life. And this is the kind of media analysis you get from that fucking guy. And, and I'm better at media analysis analysis than he is i'm a thousand times better and i'm a fucking <laughs> idiot who isn't even trying okay well let me uh just be try to be fair to anon because you know his book builds on his experience in elite circles and being at mckinsey uh to kind of you know offer a critique I don't know if you want to call it class treason, but I don't think he totally embraces the, his inner McKinsey at this point. But at the same time, you know, when you come from that kind of background, um, you know, you have to make a radical break. And it appears from what I'm hearing that he's kind of trying to, you know, balance his MSNBC friends and New York Times friends with, you know, his role as the kind of designated safe left-wing truth teller. And I'm reading a review of his book. It's really um, interesting in The Guardian, um, Anand on Elite Do-Gooding. Uh, Many of my friends are drunk on dangerous BS. So he's talking about his friends from his privileged background and how you know he's trying to talk them, talk some sense into them. Um, you know, and maybe he doesn't see the whole structure as dangerous BS, but I'm looking like right above the byline of the Guardian reporter and it says that the article is part of a section in The Guardian called Big Money. Big Money is supported by the Ford Foundation. So basically the positive review of his book is sponsored by one of the big <laughs> phony charity foundations. Um, and I guess, you know, this is their one kind of, oh, uh, here's a book that kind of critiques us. So, you know, The Guardian is still objective and fair. Um, Bill Gates also funds The Guardian's entire uh, public health section. So don't tell me these people aren't on the take. I'm with you 100 percent. Yes, these people are on the take. Uh, I don't want to be totally unfair and say, you know, he's he's Pete Buttigieg. You know, this is much more sophisticated and insidious. Yeah, I, that's that's what I'm saying. This is, much you know, this more- is the problem we're facing right now is that there's so much uh, radical discontent built up among the population uh, people are so sick of the way it is, and they're going to be even more sick of it whenever this plague is over. Um, they're just being shafted every which way. And so the cor- corporate media is putting up people who seem like radical truth tellers yeah. who are offering nothing, nothing. Com- nothing even remotely close to a nothing. structural critique uh, and are basically tamping down on dissent. Yes. And then you have all these fake alternative, seemingly adversarial publications out there uh, that, you know, are sucking up a lot of the energy. And then, you know, in an insidious way, they're pushing the color revolutions. They're pushing the new Cold War on China. They're pushing Russia Gate. Uh, they're pushing, you know, all, all, all these sort of half ass critiques of billionaires. So that's. That, I mean, and, and then they go and hang out with the same people in mainstream media that they claim to be critiquing and being adversarial against. I know how it is. I was in that. 
I, I, I was in the you know Brooklyn media world. I live in Washington. I grew up in Washington. I know how it is, and we've seen this story before. It's going to end up with the same consent, the same consent that's been manufactured every time they put up some phony adversarial voice. Um, I, you're you're a hundred percent right. What is this Brooklyn media? What the fuck do people mean when they refer to Brooklyn media? The only people I, I always thought that they were talking about Trapo uh, Trapo Trap House because I think they're from Brooklyn. But that's what do, what do people mean when they say that? Yeah, I mean it's it's really like a reference to Vice Media. Oh, okay. Vice, Vice Media. I mean, I went in their office once in Williamsburg, and it's like this gigantic sweatshop of like every. <laughs> kind of every wannabe media hipster just working in, in these little tiny cubicles. It's just, it was this giant warehouse. Then the executives sit on these great uh, leather Chesterfield couches and hold meetings. And, you know, Joe Biden visited there in 2015, received a very warm reception. Former Obama officials are in executive and high level positions advice now. And, you know, all of these people come to Brooklyn, they have tattoos and they, they look kind of, you know, different, they look radical, but they're basically advancing uh, liberal status quo behind a, you know, adversarial aesthetic. That's really the essence of Brooklyn media. And you look at the Twitter pages of these people who populate Brooklyn media and, you know, they look, you know, they definitely, you know, look more alternative than I do or you do. And, but then you look at their bio and and it's always like words and it's a bunch of mainstream corporate publications, which is where they really want to write. They have a blue check mark and they're always suckers for regime change operations, especially in Syria. They were all suckers for the white helmets. Uh, they're falling for the whole, you know, anti-China Cold War. And that helps them get ahead. It's the way of them designating that they're safe. It's like when all the liberals wore safety pins after Trump got elected, that's their their safety pin to tell the uh, execu the corporate executives advice that they're safe. They're not going to cross that red line. Okay, now I know what the people. I didn't know. I didn't know that's where Vice was headquartered in New York and Brooklyn. And so, okay, now I get it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Vice and Vice perfect is what example is. I mean, he's the perfect, perfect example. Yeah. He's the perfect him, example yeah. of him. He's a perfect example of what vice is. He's pretend radical, pretend truth teller, hipster looking, acting and talking, but actually just manufacturing consent for the establishment. That's what he's yeah, doing. And that would and I would we used to go ahead. Another perfect example would be uh, Molly Crabapple, who constantly attacks me over Syria. She compared me to a Nazi for visiting Damascus. She was advancing the regime change operation in Syria. She's like drawn, she draws murals everywhere. And she, she, she basically plagiarizes Ralph Steadman and draws his style of art and politicizes it. She drew Jamal Khashoggi on the walls of Human Rights Watch. She has a mural in Brooklyn of, uh, you know, Saudi dissident women, but she's for every regime change operation. She's for the Democrats. She's, you know, telling everyone they had to boycott RT when Russiagate started, even though she used to go on there. And she appeared in an advertisement for a Korean arms contractor ah. called Samsung advertising their phones as a cool tool for artists. And yet she runs around saying she's a socialist. So she's really the essence of the Brooklyn left to me, or not the Brooklyn left, but the Brooklyn kind of elite media world and just how ridiculous it is. Yeah. I've, uh, I've come across her on Twitter, uh, Molly Crabapple. She's, uh, uh, she's a real tool and willing. Uh, she's part of that whole crowd that constantly smears you because you yeah. are creating new space on the left. Uh, and you provide a platform for anti-imperialists and people who say forbidden truths. And that's what happens to you when you do that. Oh, it's I've, I've had it come for me from people. Uh, people attack me on social media who worked for the Young Turks uh, pushing regime change wars. And I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's how you get ahead. That's how you get ahead in media uh, is you push regime change wars. And if you don't, you are immediately ostracized, just like Chris Hedges, uh, just like anybody. Um 
Well, this has been quite... Let me see if there's anything left to him. I think he's done. I hope he's done. Let's listen if there's anything more. It comes down to a question of the Overton window. I guess the real question on it is, do you really think that these people are capable of shifting their mind because they have so much of a skin in the game in terms of the current system? Not only, as you say, in texting billionaires on the table, literally taking their money, but the perpetuation of their power, of their you know ability to speak at Aspen, of their ability to go to Harvard IOP fellowship, all these things, it all comes from the same root, ultimately. So is there actually a capability in order to change that? That's so what he's basically saying, and correct me if I'm misreading it, but I think what Sagar is saying is, you know, people get into journalism are just climbers. They're just looking out for their own careers, and it doesn't matter. And what else, whatever you have to do to get ahead, that's what they're going to do. And isn't that the real problem? It's the corporate culture that incentivizes people to to gaslight and not cover certain stories and cover just like Chomsky laid out. There's a that you get rewarded for certain things, you get fired for others. And everyone knows this. And that's what he's saying. I think that's what Sagar's saying. Would you agree? It, it seemed like a good question. So it let's see, kind of let's see how he answers. You want to see how he answers? Here we go. My skepticism. Yeah, I, I'm I'm skeptical too. That's why I, I decided to write a book about it and try to make a TV show questioning it. Like I, I think there it's it's a formidable um it's a formidable set of odds. That said, you know, if you look, if you take, I, I, I'm often comforted by a longer historical view. I, my feeling is that when five-year-olds were still working in factories, it must have seemed like really, really hard to get five-year-olds out of factories. Mm -hmm. Or when this women is, couldn't vote. This is such it probably seemed pretty impossible because who was going to vote to give women the vote when they didn't have the vote? What the um, hell? And what yet, you know, you look at the way we treated LGBTQ plus people 10 years ago, 20 years ago, certainly. I don't think anybody would think we're where we are. We would be where we are now. So, in a way, history is full of the the kind of the present is 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 very depressing right now. Um, but particularly in this pandemic, we're living through the kind of moment that has been known to change a lot of shit. Right. And I think that's actually very inspiring. See, he said shit. Is he's, he's very radical. He's very lefty. <laughs> because well, you know, Jimmy, there are no longer five year olds working in factories. Uh, that's over. <laughs> if your whole world stops at American borders. Uh. <laughs> and, and by the way, there, you know, we're not using prison labor here. We are. Uh, you know, prisoners weren't making hand sanitizer in New York State. Prisoners aren't putting out fires in California. Prisoners aren't making Victoria's Secret or whatever. It's over. It's it's. You know, so I look at the long arc of history and I'm comforted by it. It's a, so that's his way of getting everybody to stop revolting because it's all going to look how fast things things are going to change. I'm here. I wrote my book and I'm going to give it I to journalists. <laughs> what? He's I, I mean, he well, look, read my book and everything will be better. Yeah, Empire will end if you read. Can you imagine if I said that? Like, you know. Yes, I can actually. Um, <laughs> such a fucking egomaniac, but uh, <laughs> uh, the the difference is if everybody did read your book, it probably would change things. <laughs> that that is that's actually the difference. It would change habits of mind, maybe. <laughs> You know, my habit of mind to accept everything a gaslighting bullshitter with a good head of hair on TV says to me, a hipster looking guy who fucking was a McKinsey guy. It's just it's it's unbelievable. Um, and they were friendlier to the, to him than I expected them to be. Maybe they know him personally or what have you. It's hard to bag on someone, you know, personally. But uh, that was that was uh, un that was I don't know what the what people usually mean by unadulterated, but it seems like it fits there unadulterated bullshit. I don't know what it means, though. Um, it was just benign. Yeah, yeah. You have any, anything else you'd like to say at the at the at the end of this this critique of journalism? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I just I think we're doing real journalism at the gray zone and we're just punching back at the lie of the day. Uh, and that's and we're just going to keep doing that. Um, whatever these benign gatekeepers or I guess I would say malignant gatekeepers do. Uh, we're just going to be there, thegrayzone.com, and uh, we're going to be challenging what I think the next Iraqi WMD level deception is after Russiagate, which is the new Cold War with China. It's extremely dangerous. 
Uh, we have to watch out for it because this is a narrative that aims to drive a new pivot to Asia. And Obama's pivot to Asia was committing hundreds of billions of dollars to encircle China with aircraft carriers, battle fleets, ballistic missiles, uh, hypersonic jets, stealth bombers, and nuclear weapons. And this is a, this is something that could turn into a new hot war. So that's that's one of our focuses right now. And I think we need to think uh, a little bit beyond uh, the rhetoric we're hearing that's bipartisan um, that's stirring up this Cold War. So, um, you know, when you think about Iraqi WMDs, think of the lie of the day. And our main mission at the Gray Zone is to challenge it. So we're doing it uh, with pushback with Aaron Mate, uh, Red Lines with Anya Parampil, which you can see on our YouTube channel at the Gray Zone. And uh, me and Ben Norton are churning out articles along with our contributors every day. Yeah, I mean, you guys are doing great work, especially, you know, you're my go-to for uh, all foreign policy-related things, uh, especially, uh, I mean, you did a great debunking of the bullshit New York Times story on Venezuela in real time, and uh, and three weeks, took them three weeks to correct it. Uh, <laughs> and, I mean, you're the only one doing, I mean, it's, it's just, it's amazing how little real journalism is happening, and you're doing most of it. <laughs> and, it, you know, and that that's another question we should ask. Why is it so hard to do this kind of journalism. I mean, it's, we, we have a very similar model to you and it's just people like who watch your show who support us. Um, but it's very hard for a young person in this economy to get into a career like journalism and to actually do it on the regular. If you're not from an elite background, I think that's, you know, part of the critique that's constantly missed is that journalists tend to be able to go and work free internships in the summer that their parents pay for. Uh, they get, you know, fellowships that come out of the in elite connections they make at $80,000 a year journalism schools. I mean, Columbia Journalism School literally costs $80,000. And then funny. they go out there and they advance their class interests along with other people who are working in government in both parties. And we're all fucked. You know, I remember they, they, you know, everybody has interns, unpaid interns. And yeah. even at the Young Turks, I would walk in and I would say, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm an intern. You're an intern for how long? And they would say the summer. And I'm like, well, what kind of fucking person can afford to take an unpaid job for an entire summer? That's not a regular person, right? I don't know. I, I don't, I've never did an unpaid intern. I would never do an unpaid intern uh, <laughs> unless my dad could fucking bankroll me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that works. Um, I had to fucking go lay brick every summer when I was in college and most of the school year too. It, I, had, I, I don't, I don't get this fucking unpaid. I'm going to go work for no money. What the fuck kind of exploitation bullshit is that? Hey, this is the part where I tell you where our live shows are, but there aren't any. <laughs> and then I would tell you to go join our premium, but, but nobody has a fucking job. So why don't you just enjoy the video?